let, let me uh, now invite our next speaker uh, from Eurodis France, uh, Erwan Bergeron, who will talk about a very timely subject, uh, namely the impact of COVID-19 on people with rare neuromuscular dis diseases. Thank you. Do you do you hear me? Okay. So um, good uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Erwan Bergeno. I work at Eurodis. So for those who are not familiar with Eurodis, it is um, the the European Alliance of uh, Rare Diseases, and we have carried out a large scale survey last spring on the impact of COVID nineteen on people living with a rare disease. And today I am very happy to present you the results um, of the people who live with a rare neuromuscular disease. So we managed to do this survey uh, through the Rare Barometer program. So the Rare Barometer program is a survey program that transforms the rare disease patients' experiences and opinions into views and facts that can be shared with decision maker. And um, so what we have done is that we have carried out a survey online uh, from um, April to May 2020. And we've asked the, the respondents their disease through the Orphanet system of rare diseases. And that is why I was able to uh, filter the results for the rare muscular diseases. So let's start with a brief uh, description of this, the survey, um, and then we'll dive into the results uh, briefly after. So the survey was carried out from the 18th of April to the 31st of May. Um, in total, we had more than 8,000 respondents, among which 434 were living with a neuromuscular disease in Europe. There were among them 303 patients, 126 family members, also known as carer, and five patient representatives. So I can tell you what were the diseases that were the most represented in the sample. So there was um, myasthenia gravis, a proximal uh, spinal uh, muscular dystrophy, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, facial scapulohumeral dystrophy, and Steinert myotonic dystrophy. So that were the diseases that were the most represented in this sample, but there were also other diseases as well, all neuromuscular uh, related. Um, this survey was carried out online and it was translated into 23 languages, the 23 languages that are uh, the most spoken in Europe, um, to make sure that everybody could uh, participate um, to, the, to the survey. So here you can see the repetition um, per country in Europe um, with uh, neuromuscular diseases. So you see, it, 81 in France, uh, 54 in Italy, 44 in uh, Germany, uh, 49 in Poland, etc., etc. So I give you a few more seconds to have a look at the countries you're interested in. And then we'll dive into the results. So the results, the main key takeaway um, from this survey is the interruption of care that took place uh, during that first um, lockdown or confinement period. And we realized that 92% of uh, neuromuscular patients care have, has been disrupted. So this is massive, um, it's more than nine in 10 um who saw disruption of care um during that period so we have split into six different types of care uh, that i'm going to detail in a second so we're going to start with the medical therapies seven in ten couldn't have infusions or other types of medical therapies during um this period 
surgery or transplant, seven in 10 saw their intervention canceled or postponed. For medical appointments, seven in 10 got their appointments with GP or specialist canceled or postponed. For psychiatry follow-up, it's six in 10 who had their sessions interrupted. And now I'm referring to the previous um, uh, presentation that ended with questions on rehabilitation therapies. Uh, we saw how, we how important they are. And um, this one actually was the one with the highest level of interruption. So it's nine in 10 who had their ergotherapy or physiotherapy uh, or other types of rehabilitation therapies postponed or canceled. And in terms of diagnosis tests, it's seven in 10 who did not have access to blood tests, medical imaging, and other types of um, medical um, tools that help either diagnose or follow up after a surgery or a, a, a specific um, a treatment uh, that help monitor the patient. So as you can see, it was massive um, and uh, unfortunately it was very detrimental um, to, to, the, to the patients and to the carers and uh, we, we issued a few statements after that uh, in order to um, ask the government to take into consideration uh, better the people um, with uh, severe, um, severe diseases. Now I'm going to move on to the next slide. So we asked a few questions specific to hospital care. Um, and we found that it was particularly um, stressful and difficult to access for people living with um, neuromuscular diseases. So 44%, first of all, did not go to the hospital because they were scared of catching COVID-19. So it wasn't because necessarily it was closed, or be but because they were afraid um, of catching it um, when going to public facilities and here um, in hospitals. Um, we've asked uh, open questions in this survey. So open questions are questions where people are free to answer whatever they want in, in a text box. And we realized that that was mostly part, um, uh, uh, it was mostly due to the fact that people didn't have access to medical equipment, such as uh, gloves or masks at that time, and therefore um, didn't want to, to, to go to hospitals. 34% were told not to go to a hospital if their health problem was not COVID-19. So here, it's a, different, it's a different issue. It's more related to triage. Um, so it's the fact that people, uh, depending on their um, condition, are told to stay home. And here, we, we, we understand that um, um, for 34%, uh, their neuromuscular disease was not considered um, as a priority and therefore uh, were told not to come to the hospital. And for 35%, they reported that the hospital or unit that normally provides care for their rare disease was simply closed. So whether or not they could attend or they, could, they weren't afraid or they had the, the protective equipment to get to the facilities, um, it was closed. So they couldn't, they couldn't have access to it. Um, now I have, um, I have uh, s pulled out a few quotes from um, the open question. All of the quotes that you will see during this presentation are for um, uh, rare neuromuscular diseases. And they are the two on interruptions of care. So a, a woman in France told us that the physiotherapists closed their cabinets and stopped coming which is more prudent. However, having no more physiotherapy sessions for myopath is difficult and the tutorials or other training sheets are far from being as effective or satisfactory. Hopefully it doesn't last too long. So as a reminder, at that time when people answered the survey during the first wave of the COVID crisis, uh, we didn't know how long it would last. So people were even more concerned that it would last um, 
uh, for, for longer than, than it did, but it already did last two to three months, depending on the country. And in the UK, um, my son has been unable to have his checkup, heart scan, DEXA scan, and blood taken. So again, here we see that the monitoring of patients has been severely impact, uh, impacted during that, that period. Um, now I'm going to say a few words on how stressful and, and uh, complex uh, that spring 2020 was for um, the, the rare neuromuscular patients and carers. So first of all, there was a lot of fear around patients' health, and that's directly linked to the interruption of care um, that we saw uh, two slides ago. Indeed, 7 in 10 found the interruptions of care detrimental to their health. So that means that they, 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 they were feeling that the fact that they were not treated uh, was impacting their health badly. And 3 in 10 even perceived that this interruption to care could definitely, for 1 in 10 or probably for 2 in 10, be life-threatening. So that's our very strong numbers, and these are based on the patient's feeling of their own body and how they perceived um, the threat of not being uh, treated um, for two to three months. On access to treatment, 20% were unable to access their treatments. That's already a lot, uh, a lot of people who usually have access to their treatments and all of a sudden it stopped being available. But what was interesting is that 81% of those who still had access to treatments reported fear that it would stop being available at pharmacies or hospitals if the pandemic continued. So on one hand, we had the people who, who didn't have access to treatments anymore, but on the other hand, the people who did have access to treatments um, felt that the situation was very uncertain and were fearing that it would stop any day. Um, and again, at that time, we didn't know how long the, 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 the lockdown measures would last. Being well informed, uh, half of the, 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 this sample reported difficulties in accessing the information they needed on COVID-19. And that was particularly difficult for um, the rare disease and for um, rare neuromuscular diseases as well, because um, there was the, the, it was difficult to understand whether or not the condition was a risk factor um, uh, if the person becomes infected with COVID-19. So it took a lot of time uh, to, to, to figure out whether or not people were uh, at risk uh, and therefore needed to, to, to be extra careful. Protective equipment, well, that comes as no surprise. I guess for most countries, it got better today. Um, but for 7 in 10, they reported that it was uh, difficult or impossible to find plastic gloves, masks, and other protective gear. And uh, on mental health, uh, we asked a question on, on their mental health state. And two-thirds suffered from depression and or the feeling of not being able to overcome their problems since the start of the pandemic. So it comes as no surprise for the last item uh, when we see that people, um, it was a very difficult period for everyone, but it was even more challenging for the people with chronic diseases. Um, and uh, we understand that it didn't only had an effect on the body, but it had an effect on, on the mind, mind as well. Uh, here is a quote, again, from the open question um, that says, um, with, um, so it's in France, with my husband also ill, I felt very alone and abundant. I lived in my bubble with fear in my stomach at the bottom of my bed between the sixth and tenth day, serious respiratory problems would suddenly arise. I was no longer standing, no strength. I had difficulty speaking, feeding myself. So that supports um, 
the the messages that we just saw in the previous uh, slide about the fact that people uh, were uh, having uh, difficulties for their health and it had an impact on on their their um, their spirit and so now uh, we're going to see um how um, people living with neuromuscular diseases adapted rapidly to the pandemic. So um, I wanted to end this presentation with a more positive note that um, despite the fact that it was a very complicated period, uh, some solutions were found and uh, people were uh, surprisingly very uh, um, uh, uh, adaptive to the, to the situation. So first of all, e-medicine. So e-medicine took over from face to face when that was possible. So half of the people living with rare neuromuscular diseases have participated in online consultations since the start of the pandemic. And we know that it wasn't the case for most of them before the pandemic. So it proves that they changed their habits and um, found a way to continue being in contact with their uh, healthcare um, providers and professionals uh, in order to, 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 to monitor uh, their, their situation. And overall, they found it helpful. In particular, the prescriptions via email was useful. The online education tools designed to help manage rare diseases themselves was useful as well. And they found online consultation or any other form of telemedicine useful. Uh, before moving on to the next topic, I'd like to temper what I've just said with the fact that in the open question, we also had a lot of negative comments on the e-medicine. Um, first of all, a lot of people wanted to call their doctors or hospital, but never managed to do so because nobody was answering the phone. So when you see one in two have participated in online consultations, it also means that one in two did not or could not, and therefore were very frustrated um, to um, have that feeling of being um, left alone. So when it happened, it was very, very, um, very good, uh, but sometimes it didn't happen, and, and that, was, um, that was very complicated. Now let's talk about the changing working environment. So the working environment uh, of people living with uh, neuromuscular diseases who were employed at the time of the survey has drastically changed. Um, three quarter uh, started working from home, two third had more flexible hours and one third reduced the number of working hours. So that wasn't very, of course, specific um, to the, 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 the rare disease people, but still uh, it shows that this period brought um, drastic changes to the, to the everyday life routine of, uh, of the people. And I'd like to end with, with, this, um, with this note, is the, 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 the tremendous role of the family, friends, and neighbors who were very supportive during the crisis, um, and they actually filled um, the gap uh, when the society uh, couldn't uh, provide services anymore. So 75% needed their family, friends, and neighbors support during the pandemic. And that's, that's a lot of people um, who told us that in other words, um, they needed their family, friends, and neighbors to come by and help them um, in order to, to, to perform the, the daily tasks. And most of them declared that they still benefited from the help of their close relations despite the COVID-19 crisis, which wasn't the case when um, we asked them about other types of social care. Uh, most of the social care facilities were closed during that period, and the only remaining help was from the family, the friends, or the neighbors. And it was supported by the fact that we also asked whether or not the pandemic strengthened the family unit. And for 1810, it did strengthen the, the family unit. So it shows that within this, this period, um, 
the families in which there were there was a, a, a neuromuscular disease had to be more cooperative and more listening to one another in order to um, to get through it. And uh, especially because most of the the, the, the centers um, were closed and therefore couldn't um, welcome the, the patients or the carers anymore. And here we have a few quotes that will su that support um, uh, what I just uh, said. So in Spain, I am in contact with my doctor via email or phone for any questions or complications, which is appreciated because the internal medicine department is now overworked. So um, here it's about um, you understood the the. Um, the the, the e-medicine and so we see that the fact that the the, the, the gp was available um was very helpful for the patient um, and especially because the internal medicine that takes place at the hospital um was uh, probably not uh, very responsive due to the due to the the the, the overworked of the the the, the this period in the netherlands um, a, a man told us that blood samples were taken at home and medicines were delivered at home. Results and changes in treatment were communicated by telephone consultation. So here we see that um, they, he managed to have a telephone consultation, but plus um, he managed to receive um, the treatments at home instead of having to go to the pharmacy or to go to the hospital. And that came out a lot. Um, and that was very helpful because it allowed the patients who were at risk to stay at home and therefore minimize the risks of getting infected. And in Serbia, a woman told us our association helped us procure the catheters because our pharmacy could not procure them. And um, I'd like to end with that, is that the that came out a lot in the open questions. The patient associations uh, provided a tremendous help um, to the to the patients and the carers. They provided equipment. So here we see catheters, but we had other testimonies about um, uh, masks, about uh, drugs, about a, a lot of a lot of uh, equipments or. or um, or um, treatments that were very difficult to, to, to get a hand on. Um, they also provided um, the, the information they needed uh, for their rare disease in order to know whether or not they were at risk. And they also provided moral support um, that was very important um, during that, that period. Uh, so that concludes um, this presentation. I'd like to thank um, the Eurodisis uh, partners and corporate donor in 2020. And uh, I thank you um, very much for your attention. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was a very, very important set of data on the actual you know, functioning of people with uh, uh, diseases in Europe now. And uh, Dra, um Two questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, a follow-up. Do you plan any follow-up study to, uh, as you roll this to see how the burden of pandemic affects um, people with neuromuscular disorders, you know, on the way to recovery? You know, so, because we know that the, the, the healthcare systems are stressed. Yes, so that's a very good question. So um, uh, we are trying to do, uh, it's just a, a question of internal resources now because um, uh, the co we had other surveys planned, we postponed them to do this, this COVID survey, so now everything is, but we are trying to do that, especially um, we'd like to measure uh, one year after, so if we do it, we're going to do it uh, early 2021, so a year after. And uh, we'd like to understand better um, the, the, the life-threatening um, aspect of the interruption of care, because at that time it was just a month old or two months old, but now with a year of um, you know um, uh, perspective, uh, people will be uh, more 
um, knowledgeable in telling us whether or not uh, and how it really affected their health um, and their patient journey. Uh, so yeah, we, we'd like to do that. We are doing everything we can right now to put that in place, but I cannot say yes, it's for sure, but we're trying to do it. So we'll let you know um, definitely um, if we do it, but it's, uh, uh, it's, I want to say that it's probably yes, but we we'll still need to figure out a few things internally. So yeah. Yeah, because that will be very interesting and to see how countries are coping um, on, yeah. on the way to you know, restoring you know, standard healthcare services delivery. And the next question exactly. is, uh, how can you, uh, can you see any uh, good practices or patterns emerging that can improve these e-medicine delivery when it comes to rare diseases? Yes, so it really, um, so it was, it really was, so what we saw is that it really was depending on, on individual initiatives. And what we would like is that it becomes um, more systematic. Uh, and that is why half of the people were able to get a hand on their doctor and the other half couldn't. Because it was really based on the doctor willingness to answer the phone at 11 p.m. Uh, at night, to answer emails as soon as they could. Um, we also even had um, testimonies of pharmacists who willingly brought the medication to the patient's mailbox um, so that the patient didn't have to go to the pharmacy. So we thought that was very good practice. but. It was based on individual initiatives, so we cannot ask that um, every time. So we need to find a way to incentive a uh, healthcare professional to do more, um, to 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 get uh, to to keep in touch with the patient during that. It can be by telephone or email, but if the person um, has difficulties with the technology because very old or because very complicated to use a computer that uh, home uh, home delivery or um, uh, um, consultation delivered at home being more the rule uh, when it comes in, in difficult times like this ones so yes we 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 encourage to governments and and local authorities to help the healthcare professionals doing that and not just asking them to do it on their free time <laughs> you know as it was uh, mostly the case um during that that period so um but and of course again um recognize the role of the family and the friends and the close relatives um and the patient organizations the the patient organizations need to get um thank and need to get uh, funds for what they did. Uh, they provide a lot of equipment, they provide uh, helplines, they even organized conferences with, um, with doctors who were specialists in the rare disease and, and, and help shed light on whether or not the rare disease was a, a risk factor. And that cost them money, it cost them time, and, and they didn't necessarily get the funds to do it. So, um, you know, recognizing all those important partners that did, did it uh, on, their, on their free time. And uh, so, yeah, that would be tremendous. Yeah, yeah, we need some sort of standards. I mean, it's good to see yes. that people are coming and it's like a, you know, uh, a silver lining on this cloud pandemic cloud, but yet we need a standard and it will be interesting yeah. to see whether this kind of standard emerges. Thank you so much for uh, sharing this My data pleasure. with us.